When biochemists want to purify a protein, we turn to column chromatography. In this method, we take these columns that are filled with resin, so these little beads, and we flow a solution containing proteins through it. The beads, they're special, and there are different flavors of them or varieties, and we'll talk about a few of them, but basically they're going to interact differently with different proteins based on their size or their charge or some unique feature about them, such as an affinity tag, which is just a little bit extra of a protein that we can add on to the end of a protein when we're doing it like we're common in expression. So we're putting the instructions into bacteria and saying, make our protein, and we're saying, make a little extra on the end to help us purify it out. You can also be purifying protein, like native protein, so protein that cells naturally make. But in most cases, if we want to study a protein, we're doing it this recombinant way. We get the cells to make our protein, we break the cells open, um, we separate the soluble stuff from the insoluble stuff, and then we can use various forms of protein chromatography in order to purify our protein. We have these um, columns, which, can, which are filled with these resin, these little beads. And these beads have different properties that are going to interact differently with different proteins. And in this way, we're able to run a solution containing proteins through them. The different proteins will interact differently. So they'll get stuck on the column or they won't get stuck on the column or they'll go slower through the column or they'll go faster through the column. And in this way, we're able to separate proteins to isolate the one that we want. So when we do chromatography, you'll see a couple of different um, methods used. So we can either be doing things in like gravity flow. Um, so gravity flow, where you basically pack your own columns. So you fill these columns with resin and there's all sorts of different size columns you can use, or we can use a machine. Um, so commonly this is, like, this is like an ACTA, that's just like a brand name. Um, and here it's actually going to use pumps to push the liquid through. Um, through the columns. Again, these columns are going to be filled with different types of resin. So this resin, remember these are just like little beads with different features. And so there's kind of like three main types that we'll be talking about. We'll be talking about affinity chromatography, ion exchange chromatography, and size exclusion chromatography, which are all going to take advantage of different things about different proteins. Let's take them one by one. With affinity chromatography, we're gonna be separating based on a specific feature such as a tag. With ion exchange chromatography, we're going to be separating based on charge. And with size exclusion chromatography, we're gonna be separating proteins based on their size. So we'll go into each of these in a little more detail. Um, but know that often these techniques are kind of done in series so that we can get a protein really, really pure. So how many different purification methods you use is going to depend on how pure you need your protein to be. Um, if we're dealing with things like structural biology, where we want really, really pure proteins, then we often do multiple column chromatography um, steps in a row. Often like we'll do affinity chromatography to get rid of most stuff, then ion exchange chromatography, um, and then size exclusion chromatography or gel filtration, and that will get us um, get us hopefully very, very pure protein. But often for just like the quick and dirty method, we'll be doing affinity chromatography. And so let's start there. The reason why we want to start with affinity chromatography is basically it's going to be the most specific. So affinity chromatography, what happens here is that your protein has some specific feature that's kind of unique to it. And so most classically, this is going to be one of those um, one of those protein tags, those affinity tags that we stick onto our protein when we're when we're doing that recombinant expression, when we're doing that cloning, we just stick a few extra amino acids onto the end. And then we can use resin that has a group attached to it that can actually bind specifically to that specific sequence. So because lots of people put the same specific sequence onto their protein, these companies, will then sell this stuff cheaply, where you're or relatively cheaply, still pretty expensive, um, but it's cheaper than having to kind of design something that would bind to every single pro different protein. If you can design something to bind to that little tag that people add onto their protein. And so a couple of the common tags are gonna be like a his tag or a strep tag. And then these affinity chromatography beads, they'll have kind of like the matching group for that. Now what's gonna happen is when you flow your protein with that tag through the, um, through the column, your protein's gonna stick, but that other stuff is not. 
And so then you can kind of wash all that other stuff off while your protein is stuck to the column. And then you can add a competitor to kind of um, compete off your protein. So you add something that looks like the tag or the tag itself or whatever, um, and then this will push off the, your protein and allow you to get a pure protein in the absence of all of that stuff that you washed off. And we call the process when it's like coming off as a lucian, and we call, call refer to like an eluent, which is basically the stuff that's coming off the column. And we can refer to the stuff that goes straight through the column as flow through. And then the other stuff is kind of like our washes. So we're hoping that our protein of interest comes out in the LU in fact we want at the end. So again, a couple examples are his tag. So a his tag is just six to eight histidines in a row. Um, and it's going to bind metal coated regosins. Um, so some often what you'll see is you'll see like nickel NTA. Um, and things like this, you might also see like talon, which is, I think that's, that one is um, cobalt. There's various different metals that are used. And so histidine, we'll look at later, it's going to be very good at coordinating metals. Um, and so histidine, if you put a bunch of them in a row, it's going to be able to bind to, bind to that column. Then what you do is basically once it's bound, then you wash all that other stuff off. And then you push it off with this, in this case, imidazole, which is going to act as a competitor. And imidazole is basically just that side chain part of histidine. Another common affinity tag is a strep tag. So a strep tag, it is going to kind of mimic biotin. And what it will do is it will bind to this streptactin resin, which mimics streptavidin. So there's this crazy, super strong interaction between biotin and streptavidin. And you can take advantage of a quite weaker version of this so that your protein doesn't get stuck on the column. But basically you have this mimic of the biotin, but like kind of like a protein form, because remember all you can do is add protein to the end and you are going to therefore have this bind in to this resin, wash everything else off, and then you compete it off with this style biotin, which is another mimic of biotin that is this way, kind of the biotin doesn't get too tightly stuck on the column when you're trying to get your protein to come off. You don't need to know all these details. You just need to know the core idea that you can add an affinity tag to your protein and then use affinity chromatography to specifically capture your protein, wash away the other stuff, and then compete off your protein. Often these affinity tags, they actually, when you put them on your protein, you add a little bit of extra sequence in between the tag and your protein that serves as a protease recognition set sequence. So when we talk about a protease, that's going to be a protein cutter. Some proteases we don't like because they're just gonna chew up our proteins when we're working with them. But these ones are going to be site specific. And so they're going to recognize that specific sequence and then we can cut the tag away from our protein. With something like a really small tag, you might need not, not need to worry about cutting that tag off because it might not interfere. But sometimes we're dealing with a bigger tag, something like GST, which is actually like a whole protein fused onto the end of your protein. Um, and so this could interfere with further things. And so then you're often going to cut it off. Of course, once you've cut it off, well, now you don't have that specific feature about your protein to take advantage of. So you have to turn to natural properties about the protein. One of the ways that you can do this is ion exchange chromatography because, well, all proteins are gonna have some sort of charge. All proteins have a different combination of amino acids. And as we've seen, different amino acids can have different charges and this will all depend on the pH. So remember that the PI, that's the isoelectric point. That's the point at which a multiprotic molecule is net neutral. And so when we talk about a protein, that is definitely counts as one of those multiprotic molecules. And so it's going to have this PI, this point at which it's net neutral. And why this matters is because, well, if we're at a lower pH than that, remember there's more protons. And so this means that we're gonna have a positive charge overall for our protein. And if we're at a pH that is higher than our PI, well, then our protein is going to be negatively charged. And well, we know that opposite charges attract one another. So if we have a positively charged protein, we can get it to stick to negatively charged resin. And if we have negatively charged protein, we can get it to stick to positively charged resin.
When we talk about something that's positively charged, we're talking about a cation. And we talk about something that's negatively charged, we're talking about an anion. So what we can do is we can use methods called cation exchange and anion exchange in order to separate proteins based on being positive or negatively charged. If we have a positively charged protein, we're going to want negative resin. I mean, this is in a strategy called cation exchange. The exchange is because we're going to be exchanging um, salt cations, so like sodium ions, for your protein, um, and then exchanging back off for salts once again. And so with cation exchange, your protein is cationic. You want the opposite for it, and the resin is going to be negatively charged or anionic. With anion exchange, your protein is anionic, so it's negatively charged, and you're dealing with positively charged resin. In this case, what you're going to be exchanging is going to be exchanging like the chloride ions or whatever the anion is in the salt. Now, what's going to happen is that your protein is going to be able to displace the salt and bind. But if you add more and more salt, well, then your protein is going to get um, your protein is going to kind of be competed off similarly to with affinity chromatography, except here we're competing it off with salt molecules. You can also get your protein to come off by changing the charge of the protein, by changing the pH, because remember that the charge is going to be dependent on the pH. But typically we're using salt because, well, if you change the pH, the protein might be mad at you. With ion exchange chromatography, as well as affinity chromatography, you can do it either stepwise or gradient. So stepwise is you go from one concentration to another to another, whereas gradient, you do a gradient from one to another. And so a gradient, is kind of great when you want to separate things granularly, but you have to use one of the machines, or I guess you could probably figure out a way to do it manually. But when you're just using gravity flow, the stepwise makes things a lot easier. But if you don't do kind of it just right, then you'll end up eluding your stuff and a bunch of other stuff that you don't want. The final type we'll talk about is size exclusion chromatography, aka gel filtration, or you might see it abbreviated SEC. This is going to separate proteins based on their size. It's often used as a sort of last polishing step. Um, and the way that it works is that instead of things sticking to the beads, the things actually go, your proteins go through and around the beads. So these beads are filled with these little pores, these little like secret tunnels, and there's different sized ones. And the small proteins, well, they're going to get kind of tied up going through all of those little tunnels, but the big ones are not even going to fit in those tunnels, so they don't, they get to take a shortcut. You can think of it kind of like um, a series of roads, and you have little cars, and you have big trucks, and the big trucks can't go through all of those tunnels, so they get to take shortcuts around them, but the little guys have to go through all those tunnels, and so they're going to take longer to go through the column. And therefore, the bigger things are going to come out first, the smaller things are going to come out later. There are a ton of different types of columns that we can use, um, and they can be filled with different types of resin. They're often like sugar-based or some sort of agarose, um, or um, there's some sort of dextrose. There's various ones, stabilized, stabilized sugars. And so you might see things like superdex. You might think, see things like superose. I don't know how you spell that. It might be an O. Um, but anyway, you don't need to know these different names. But if you see something come up like that, that's probably what it's talking about, um, this size exclusion chromatography. Whenever you see a word in a method that you don't know what is, just Google it. Um, and so if you Google it, and it'll tell you it's a size exclusion column, and then you're like, oh, I know what size exclusion columns are, um, without having to know, like, oh, what's superos? Um, so Google is your friend when we're, when we're reading papers, when we're dealing with methods. Um, that's where you're often going to go in order to find the basic information about like what the brand name you're looking at is actually referring to. Um, but then I want you to know basically the idea with size exclusion chromatography is that you're going to be separating proteins based on their size. You might see this in preparative, which is what we've been talking about here, which is when you're actually purifying a protein. Um, people also use it for like analytical purposes where you use a smaller column and you're trying to see if proteins are sticking to one another because if they stick to one another, they're going to be bigger. Um, and so they travel together, they're going to come out sooner. So to review, protein chromatography is a way in which we can purify proteins based on their different properties.
we take advantage of different properties of resin, so little beads that these columns are filled with. And so we can have the columns either like we pack them by ourselves and just flow things through through gravity, or we can use a machine like an ACTA, an FPLC machine that actually pumps our liquid through the columns. In the case of affinity chromatography and ion exchange chromatography, here our proteins are kind of like actually sticking to the columns because of charge in the case of ion exchange or because of a special feature like an affinity tag in the case of our affinity chromatography. They could also have cases where you're using some sort of natural feature, special feature about a protein, such as its ability to bind DNA, maybe you have a DNA coded column or something like that but often it's gonna be one of these affinity tags like a his tag or a strep tag. In the case of the affinity chromatography, we're going to compete our proteins off using a competitor that kind of looks like the tag. In the case of our ion exchange chromatography, here we can basically compete off our proteins with salts. And so we can use anion exchange if we have a negatively charged protein or anionic protein, and we can use cation exchange if we have a positively charged protein. Remember, we often refer to kind of like positively charged proteins as basic and negatively charged ones as acidic, but that's all going to depend on the pH as well, their actual charge. In terms of the size exclusion chromatography here, our proteins aren't actually sticking to the column, they're just going through, but they're going through it in different rates. The smaller ones are going to get have to go through more tunnels than the beads, and so they're going to travel slower. They're going to come out sooner than the bigger proteins, which get to go around those, those little holes and only have to go through the big ones. And so those are going to come out faster. You often are doing the size exclusion with one of those FPLC machines, and you can monitor the proteins actually come off by using their UV absorbance. At the end of the purification, typically you're going to want to check and make sure your protein is actually pure, which you can do with something like an SDS page gel. You can measure its concentration with Bradford or UV, and then you can play with it. Often, if you're just doing like a one-step purification, you're going to want to choose that affinity chromatography. Remember, it's kind of the most specific because your protein might have a his tag, but those other proteins in the bacteria aren't going to. And so, therefore, you can take advantage of that and get your protein. Often, you can get it fairly pure with just that one step, but you might want to then follow up with something like dialysis in order to remove all that competitor or all that salt or whatever you have in your buffer that you might not want around. And so with dialysis, you place your protein in a little membrane pouch, put it in um, like a bath of buffer that you do want it in without what you don't want it in. And then your, what you don't want will diffuse out, what you do want will diffuse in. And as long as you chose the right membrane, your protein will stay in as well. Then you can go and you can do things like play with it or you can freeze it often with some sort of cryoprotectant, something like glycerol to keep ice crystals from forming within your protein.